Section 7 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Matilda of Scotland, Chapter 1, Part 1. When we consider the perils to which the representatives of our ancient line of sovereigns, Edgar Atheling and his sisters, were exposed during the usurpation of Harold and the Norman reigns of terror, it almost appears as if an overruling providence had guarded these descendants of the great Alfred, for the purpose of continuing the lineage of that patriot king on the throne of these realms, through the marriage of Henry I, with the daughter of Margaret Etheline, Matilda of Scotland. This princess, the subject of our present biography, is distinguished among the many illustrious females that have worn the crown matrimonial of England, by the title of the Good Queen, a title which, eloquent in its simplicity, briefly implies that she possessed not only the great and shining qualities calculated to add luster to a throne, but that she employed them in promoting the happiness of all classes of her subjects, affording at the same time a bright example of the lovely and endearing attributes which should adorn the female character. Some historians call this Princess Matilda Etheline, and by these she is almost invested with the dignity of a queen regnant, and styled the heiress of the Anglo-Saxon monarchs. In the same spirit, her grandson and representative, Henry the Second, is designated the restorer of the English royal line. This is, however, as Blackstone justly observes, a great error, for the rights of Margaret Etheline to the English succession were vested in her sons, and not in her daughter. James I, on his ascension to the throne of England, failed not to set forth that important leaf in his pedigree, and laid due stress on the circumstances of his descent, from the ancient line of English sovereigns by the elder blood. Alexander, the archdeacon of Salisbury, who wrote the tracts of the exchequer, quoted by Jervis of Tilbury in his celebrated dialogues of the exchequer, has gravely set forth, in his red book, a pedigree of Matilda of Scotland, tracing her descent in an unbroken line up to Adam. There is a strange medley of Christian kings and pagan sinners, such as Woden and Balder, with the Jewish patriarchs of Holy Writ, in this royal genealogy. Matilda is the only princess of Scotland who ever shared the throne of a king of England. It is, however, from her maternal ancestry that she derives her great interest, as connected with the annals of this country. Her mother, Margaret Etheling, was the granddaughter of Edmund Ironside and the daughter of Edward Etheling, surnamed the outlaw, by Agatha, daughter of the Emperor Henry II of Germany. Her brother, Edgar Etheling, so often mentioned in the preceding biography, feeling some reason to mistrust the apparent friendship of William the Conqueror, privately withdrew from his court, and in the year 1068, the same year in which Henry I was born, took shipping with Margaret and their younger sister Christina, and their mother Agatha, intending to seek a refuge in Hungary, with their royal kindred. But by stress of weather, the vessel in which they, with many other English exiles, were embarked, was driven into the Frith of Forth, Malcolm Canmore, the young unmarried king of Scotland, who had just regained his dominions from the usurper Macbeth, happened to be present when the royal fugitives landed, and was so struck with the beauty of the Lady Margaret Etheling, that in a few days he asked her in marriage of her brother. Edgar joyfully gave the hand of the dowerless princess to the young and handsome sovereign, who had received the exiled English in the most generous and honorable manner, and whose disinterested affection was sufficient testimony of the nobleness of his disposition. The spot where Margaret first set foot on the Scottish land was, in memory of that circumstance, called Queen's Ferry, the name it bears to this day. The Saxon chronicler, of whom this lady is an especial favorite, indulges in a most edifying homily, on the providence which led the holy Margaret to become the spouse of the King of Scotland, 
who is evidently regarded by the cowled historian as little better than pagan. Certainly it is, that the mighty son of the gracious Duncan could neither read nor write. After her marriage, the Saxon princess became the happy instrument of diffusing the blessings of Christianity throughout her husband's dominions, commencing the work of conversion in the proper place, her own household, and the court. The influence which her personal charms had in the first instance won over the heart of her royal husband. Her virtues and mental powers increased and retained to the last hour of Malcolm's existence. He reposed the most unbounded confidence, not only in the principles, but the judgment of his English consort, who became the domestic legislator of the realm. She dismissed from the palace all persons who were convicted of leading immoral lives, or who were guilty of fraud or injustice, and allowed no persons to hold office in the royal household, unless they conducted themselves in a sober and discreet manner. Observing, moreover, that the Scottish nobles had an irreverent habit of rising from table before grace could be pronounced by her pious chaplain, Turgo, she rewarded those of the most civilized chiefs, who could be induced to attend the performance of that edifying ceremony, with a cup of the choicest wine. The temptation of such a bribe was too powerful to be resisted by the hitherto perverse and graceless peers, and by degrees the custom became so popular that every guest was eager to claim his grace cup. The fashion spread from the palace to the castles of the nobility, and thence descending to the dwellings of their humbler neighbors, became an established usage in the land. Many deeply interesting, as well as amusing particulars, connected with the parents of Matilda of Scotland, the subject of our present memoir, have been preserved by the learned Turgo, the historian of this royal family, who, in his capacity of confessor to Queen Margaret, and preceptor to her children, enjoyed opportunities of becoming acquainted, not only with all personal particulars respecting these illustrious individuals, but of learning their most private thoughts and feelings. Turgo gives great commendation to his royal mistress, for the conscientious care she bestowed on the education of her children, whose preceptors she enjoined, to punish them as often as their faults required correction. Matilda, the subject of this memoir, was her eldest daughter, and was probably born in the year 1077. This we infer from the remarkable circumstance of the elder brother of her future husband, Robert Courthose, being her godfather. Malcolm Canmore, her father, invaded England in that year, and Robert of Normandy was, on his reconciliation with his father, William the Conqueror, sent with a military force to repel this northern attack. Robert, finding his forces inadequate to maintain successfully a war of aggression, entered into a negotiation with the Scottish monarch, which ended in a friendly treaty. Malcolm renewed his homage for Cumberland, and Robert, who, whatever his faults might be as a private character, was one of the most courteous knights and polished gentlemen of the age in which he lived, finally cemented the auspicious amity, which he had established between his royal sire and the warlike husband of the heiress presumptive of the Saxon line of kings, by becoming the sponsor of the infant Princess Matilda. Some historians assert that the name of the little princess was originally Editha, and that it was, out of compliment to the Norman prince her godfather, changed to Matilda, the name of his beloved mother. The contemporary chronicler, or Duricus Vitalis, says, Matilda demque prius dicta es Editha, Matilda, whose first name was Edith. Matilda the Good received her earliest lessons of virtue and piety from her illustrious mother, and of learning from the worthy Turgo, the preceptor of the royal children of King Malcolm and Queen Margaret of Scotland. When Matilda was very young, there appears to have been an attempt on the part, either of the queen her mother, or her aunt Christina Etheline, the celebrated abbess of Rumsey, to consecrate her to the church, or at least to give her tender mind a conventual bias, greatly to the displeasure of the king her father, who once, as Matilda herself testified, when she was brought into his presence, dressed in a nun's veil, snatched it from her head in a great passion, and indignantly tore it in pieces, observing at the same time, to Alan, Duke of Bretagne, who stood by, 
that he intended to bestow her in marriage, and not to devote her to a cloister. This circumstance, young as she was, appears to have made a very deep impression on the mind of the little princess, and probably assisted in strengthening her determination, in after years, never to complete the profession of which she was, at one period of her life, compelled to assume the semblance. Alan, Duke of Bretagne, to whom King Malcolm addressed this observation, was the widower of William the Conqueror's daughter Constance, and though there was a great disparity of years between him and Matilda, it appears certain, from his after-proposals, that the object of his visit to the Scottish court was to form a matrimonial alliance with the young Matilda, and this was, indubitably, one of the unsuitable matches to which we shall find that Matilda afterwards alluded. Matilda's uncle, Edgar Etheling, became resident at the court of her father and mother for some time, in the year 1091, Robert Courthouse having sacrificed his friendship to the temporary jealousy of William Rufus. This displeasure did not last long, for both the eldest sons of William the Conqueror seemed to have cherished an affection for the Etheling, and he was often treated with confidence and generosity by each. The misunderstanding, which occasioned Edgar's retreat into Scotland, was productive of ultimate good to this country, as both Rufus and Malcolm joined in appointing him as arbiter of peace between England and Scotland, which were then engaged in a furious and devastating war. Thus placed, in the most singular and romantic position that ever was sustained by a disinherited heir, Edgar conducted himself with such zeal and impartiality, as to give satisfaction to both parties, and the war terminated in a reasonable peace, which afforded a breathing time of two years to the harassed people of this island. After a reconciliation with William Rufus, which was never afterwards broken by the most trying circumstances, Edgar returned to the court of his favorite friend and companion, Robert of Normandy. The British kingdoms remained at peace till the dangerous illness of William Rufus, at Gloucester, tempted King Malcolm Canmore to invade his dominions in the year 1093, for the purpose, as he said, of revenging the insults he had received from the Anglo-Norman sovereign. But in all probability his real object was to take advantage of Rufus's unpopularity with all classes, if his arms were crowned with success, and to set up the rival title of the descendants of the great Alfred, with whom he was now so closely united. For the fifth time he now proceeded to ravage Northumberland. Hector Bothius and Buchanan insisted that Malcolm was killed at the siege of Alnwick Castle, by the treachery of the besieged, who, being reduced to the last extremity, offered to surrender, if the Scottish king would receive the keys in person. Malcolm of course acceded to this condition, and coming to the gates, was there met by a knight bearing the keys on the point of a lance, which he offered to the king on his knee. But when Malcolm stooped to receive them, he treacherously thrust the point of the lance through the bars of his visor, into his eye, and gave him a mortal wound, of the anguish of which he died. This was heavy news to pour into the anxious ear of the widowed queen, who then lay on her deathbed, attended by her daughters Matilda and Mary. The particulars of this sad scene are thus related by an eyewitness, the faithful Turgot. During a short interval of ease, Queen Margaret devoutly received the communion. Soon after, her anguish of body returned with redoubled violence. She stretched herself on the couch, and calmly awaited the moment of her dissolution. Cold, and in the agonies of death, she ceased not to put up her supplications to heaven. These were some of her words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out mine iniquities. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. At that moment her young son, Prince Edgar, returned from the disastrous English expedition, and approached her couch. How fares it with the king and my Edward? asked the dying queen. The youthful prince stood mournfully silent. 
I know all, I know all, cried his mother. Yet, by this holy cross, I adjure you, speak out the worst. And Margaret presented to the view of her son, that celebrated black cross which she had brought with her from England, as the most precious possession she derived from her royal Saxon ancestors. Your husband and eldest son are both slain, replied the prince. Lifting her eyes and hands towards heaven, she said, Praise and blessing be to thee, almighty God, that thou hast been pleased to make me endure so bitter anguish in the hour of my departure, thereby, as I trust, to purify me in some measure from the corruption of my sins. And thou, O Lord Jesus Christ, who, through the will of the Father, hast given life to the world by thy death, O oh, deliver me! While pronouncing the words, deliver me, she expired. The reputation of her virtues, and the report that miracles had been wrought at her tomb, caused her name to be enrolled in the catalogue of saints by the Church of Rome. Whatever may be thought of the miracles, it is a pleasure to find the following enlightening passage from the pen of a Catholic ecclesiastic of the 11th century. Others, says Turgo, may admire the indications of sanctity which miracles afford. I much more admire in Margaret the works of mercy. Such signs, namely miracles, are common to the evil and to the good. But the works of true piety and charity are peculiar to the good. With better reason, therefore, ought we to admire the deeds of Margaret which made her saintly, than her miracles, had she performed any. To this great and good man did the dying Margaret consign the spiritual guardianship of her two young daughters, the princesses Matilda and Mary, and her younger sons. Turgot has preserved the words with which she gave him this important charge. They will strike an answering chord on the heart of every mother. Farewell, she said. My life draws to a close, but you may survive me long. To you I commit the charge of my children. Teach them, above all things, to love and fear God, and if any of them should be permitted to attain to the height of earthly grandeur, oh then, in an especial manner be, to them, a father and a guide. Admonish, and if need be, reprove them, lest they should be swelled with the pride of momentary glory, and through covetousness, or by reason of the prosperity of this world, offend their creator and forfeit eternal life. This, in the presence of him who is now our only witness, I beseech you to promise and perform. Adversity was soon to try these youthful scions of royalty, with her touchstone, of the Princess Matilda, as well as her saintly mother, it may justly be said, Stern, rugged nurse, thy rigid lore, with patience many a year she bore. Soon after the disastrous defeat and death of her royal father and eldest brother, Donald Bain, the illegitimate brother of Malcolm Canmore, seized the throne of Scotland, and commanded all the English exiles, of whatsoever degree, to quit the kingdom, under pain of death. Edgar Etheline, Matilda's uncle, then conveyed to England the orphan family of his sister, the Queen of Scotland, consisting of five young princes and two princesses. He supported Matilda, her sister and brothers, who were all minors, privately with his own means. They were in considerable personal danger, from the accusation of one of the knights at the English court, who told William Rufus, that the Saxon prince had brought into England, and was raising up, a family of competitors for the English crown. A friend of Edgar challenged and slew this mischievous tale-bearer, and William Rufus, supposing Providence had decided in favor of the innocent, treated Edgar and his adopted family with kindness and friendship. The princesses Matilda and Mary were placed by their uncle in the nunnery of Rumsey, of which his surviving sister Christina was abbess. And for the princes, he sought and obtained an honorable reception for them at the court of William Rufus, who eventually sent him at the head of an army to Scotland, with which the Ethelene succeeded in re-establishing his nephew, the elder brother of Matilda, on the throne of his ancestors. Ordericus Vitalis confirms, in a great measure, the statements of Turgot, and, after relating the death of Queen Margaret, adds, she sent her two daughters, Edith, Matilda, and Mary, to Christina, her sister, 
who was a religious in the abbey of Rumsey, to be instructed by her in holy writ. These princesses were a long time pupils among the nuns. They were instructed by them, not only in the art of reading, but in the observance of good manners. And these devoted maidens, as they approached the age of womanhood, waited for the consolation of God. As we have said, they were orphans, deprived of both their parents, separated from their brothers, and far from the protecting care of kindred or friends. They had no home or hope but the cloister, and yet, by the mercy of God, they were not professed as nuns. They were destined by the disposer of all earthly events for better things. Camden proves that the Abbey of Wilton, ever since the profession of the saintly princess Editha, was the place of nurture and education for all the young princesses of the Anglo-Saxon royal family. This abbey of black Benedictine nuns had been founded by King Alfred, and since his days had always received a lady of his royal line as its abbess, a custom which does not seem to have been broken by the deposition of his family. Wilton Abbey had been refounded by Queen Editha, consort of Edward the Confessor. While that monarch was building Westminster Abbey, his queen was employing her revenues in changing the nunnery of Wilton, from a wooden edifice into one of stone. The Abbey of Rumsey was likewise a royal foundation, generally governed by an abbess of the family of Alfred. Christina is first mentioned as abbess of Rumsey in Hampshire, and afterwards as superior of the Wilton convent. As both belonged to the order of black Benedictines, this transfer was not difficult, but chroniclers do not mention when it was effected, simply stating the fact that the Scottish princess first dwelled at Rumsey, but that when she grew up, she was resident at Wilton Abbey, under the superintendence of the abbess Christina, her aunt. Matilda thus became an inhabitant of the same abode where the royal virgins of her race had always received their education. It was the express desire of the queen, her mother, who survived that request but a few hours, that she should be placed under the care of the Lady Christina at Rumsey. While in these English convents, the royal maid was compelled to assume the thick black veil of a votaress, as a protection from the insults of the lawless Norman nobles. The abbess Christina, her aunt, who was exceedingly desirous of seeing her beautiful niece become a nun professed, treated her very harshly, if she removed this cumbersome and inconvenient envelope, which was composed of coarse black cloth or serge. Some say it was a tissue of horse hair. The imposition of this veil was considered by Matilda as an intolerable grievance. She wore it, as she herself acknowledged, with sighs and tears, in the presence of her stern aunt, and the moment she found herself alone, she flung it on the ground, and stamped it under her foot. During the seven years that Matilda resided in this dreary asylum, she was carefully instructed in all the learning of the age. Ordericus Vitalis says, she was taught the literatorium artem, of which she afterwards became, like her predecessor, Matilda of Flanders, a most munificent patroness. She was also greatly skilled in music, for which her love amounted almost to a passion. When queen, we shall find her sometimes censored, for too great liberality she showed in rewarding, with costly presents, the monks who sang skillfully in the church service. The superior education which this illustrious princess received, during these years of conventual seclusion, eminently fitted her to become the consort of so accomplished a prince as Henry Le Beauclerc. Robert of Gloucester, and peers of Langtoft, and above all Edmer, a contemporary, asserted that the royal pair had been lovers before circumstances admitted of their union. These are the words of quaint old Robin on the subject. Special love had e'er been, as I understand, between him and the king's fair daughter, Maud of Scotland, so that he willed her to wife, and the bishops also, and the high men of the land ran day him thereto. Matilda received two proposals of marriage while she was in the nunnery at Rumsey, one from Alan, Duke of Britagaine, the mature suitor before mentioned, who demanded her in marriage of his brother-in-law, William Rufus, and obtained his consent, but he was prevented by death from fulfilling his engagement. Had it been otherwise, 
Matilda's only refuge from this ill-assorted union would have been the irrevocable assumption of the black veil, of which she had testified such unqualified abhorrence. The other candidate for the hand of the exiled princess was the young and handsome William Warren, Earl of Surrey, the son of the conqueror's youngest daughter, Gundred, the favorite nephew of William Rufus, and one of the richest and most powerful of the baronage of England and Normandy. The profession of Matilda was delayed for a time by the addresses of these princes. But, continues the chronicler, she was, by the grace of God, reserved for a higher destiny, and through his permission contracted a more illustrious marriage. It is remarkable that of the three lovers by whom Matilda was sought in marriage, one should have been the son-in-law, another the grandson, and the third the son, of the Norman conqueror, who had established a rival dynasty on the throne of her ancestors. Matilda pleaded her devotion to a religious life as an excuse for declining the addresses of Warren, though, under existing circumstances, it seems strange that she should have preferred a lengthened sojourn in the gloomy cloister to a union with a young, handsome, and wealthy peer of the blood royal of the reigning sovereign of England. And her refusal of Warren affords some reason for giving credence to the statements of Edmer, robert gloucester and others of the ancient chroniclers as to the special love that existed between henry beauclerc and matilda during the season of their mutual adversity matilda was at that time residing in the nunnery of wilton not far from winchester the principal seat of the norman sovereign when we reflect on the great intimacy which subsided between matilda's uncle edgar etheling and the sons of the conqueror it appears by no means improbable that prince henry might have accompanied him in some of his visits to his royal kinswomen in the nunnery of wilton and perhaps been admitted under the sanction of his presence to converse with the princesses and even to have enjoyed the opportunity of seeing matilda without her veil which we learn from her own confession she took every opportunity of throwing aside According to the testimony of ancient chroniclers, especially the Chronicle of Normandy, this princess was remarkable for her beauty. Matthew Paris says she was very fair and elegant in person, as well as learned, holy and wise. These qualities, combined with her high lineage, rendered her doubtless an object of attraction to the Norman princes. Henry Beauclerc was ten years the senior of his nephew Warren, but his high mental acquirements and accomplishments were, to a mind like that of Matilda of Scotland, far beyond the meretricious advantages which his more youthful rival could boast. Robert Gloucester, in his rhyming chronicle, gives this quaint summary of the birth, education, and characteristics of Henry. In England he was born, Henry, this nobleman, in the third year that his father England Wayne, he was, of all his sons, best fitted king to be, of fairest form and manners, and most gentle and free, for that he was the youngest to book his father him drew, and he became as it befell a good clerk and now. One time when he was young, his brother smote him, I wis, and he wept while his father stood by and beheld all this. Nay, weep now, he said, loving son, for it shall come to be, that thou shalt yet be king, and that thou shalt see. His father made him at Westminster, knight of his own hand, in the nineteenth year of his age, etc., etc. Taller he was some deal than his brethren were, fair men and stout and now, with brown hair. End of section 7